In the observable universe, there are hundreds of millions of galaxies, each containing hundreds of millions of stars and a similar number of planets. Many people, upon hearing these figures, immediately assume that space must be teeming with civilizations as advanced as ours or even more so. It's understandable since, even if intelligent life arises on only one in a million planets, there are so many worlds in the universe that there should be hundreds of millions of advanced civilizations sending signals into space. However, no matter how much we scan the skies, we don't detect any trace of this supposed life. This apparent discrepancy between the vastness of the cosmos and how empty it seems is known as the Fermi Paradox, and it can be explained in many ways. Perhaps the universe is full of life, but most of it consists of single-celled organisms, because the leap from single-celled to multicellular life is very difficult. Or maybe, nearly all intelligent civilizations tend to self-destruct before developing advanced communications. There are also more cinematic explanations, such as a few aggressive civilizations that destroy everything in their path, or that we are kept isolated in some sort of galactic nature reserve. But there's an option that's not mentioned as often, probably because it's not as dramatic. That there is simply much less life out there than we assume. That the emergence of life is an incredibly improbable event that has only occurred on a handful of planets in the entire universe. And if this explanation is correct, the reason space seems so empty could be the reddish element contained in this capsule. You've likely heard many times that carbon is the basis of life, and yes, that's true. But carbon alone cannot produce anything living. In fact, if we removed all elements from any terrestrial organism except carbon, all that would remain would be a pile of black dust. To create living beings, carbon needs to combine with other elements to form complex organic molecules. Among the most critical elements for life are hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur, the chomps elements. Living beings also need smaller amounts of other elements, but the one we're interested in now is the P in chomps, phosphorus. You may know phosphorus from the red tip of matches that ignites when struck, but be aware, this material isn't pure phosphorus, it's a mix of various substances, including tetraphosphorus trisulfide. Covering matches with pure phosphorus wouldn't be a good idea because this element ignites upon contact with air and emits toxic phosphorus oxide vapors, which is precisely why phosphorus is used to make incendiary bombs. It's somewhat contradictory that phosphorus has military uses because this element keeps living beings, well, alive. It's true that phosphorus makes up only a tiny part of an organism's mass, but its atoms are present in many types of organic molecules critical for life. For instance, phospholipids are the main component of cell membranes, and calcium phosphate is the basis of bones and teeth. And then there's adenosine triphosphate, ATP, the substance used by the simplest bacteria to the most complex animals to store and produce energy and make their DNA. In other words, as wonderful as carbon is, life as we know it cannot exist without phosphorus. Some might argue, well, maybe extraterrestrial life is different from what we know and doesn't depend on carbon or phosphorus. That's certainly possible, but I've explained elsewhere why it's unlikely. This strong connection between life and phosphorus might determine how populated the universe is. That is, if extraterrestrial biology depends on phosphorus as much as ours does, the most decisive factor in whether a planet develops life could be how much phosphorus it contains. Oceans of liquid water and mild temperatures would take a back seat if potential life lacked sufficient phosphorus. It could never arise. And that's bad news for any potential extraterrestrial civilization, because phosphorus is the least abundant of the chomps. To be precise, there is about a thousand times less phosphorus than carbon, oxygen, or nitrogen in the universe. And the reason for this scarcity lies with the stars. Let me explain. To summarize, the first nebulas formed after the Big Bang contained only hydrogen and helium, two gases that can't form rocky planets or life because they are gases. Luckily, the densest regions of these clouds collapsed under their own gravity and turned into giant stars that began to fuse their hydrogen and helium atoms. Besides releasing a lot of energy, this process converted the atoms of these two simple gases into heavier elements like carbon, oxygen, silicon, phosphorus, and iron. When the first giant stars exploded as supernovas at the end of their lives, they expelled all these new elements into space. In the cold, empty expanse of space, this material condensed and formed solid grains of rock and metal, which then became part of the gas clouds filling the cosmos. From then on, whenever a new star formed, the dust grains trapped in its orbit collided, merged, and grew into rocky planets. Not all elements come from giant stars, 
some form inside medium-sized stars, others during the explosion of white dwarf stars, and others from the collisions of neutron stars. Depending on which and how many of these events occur near a nebula, the planets that form in it will be enriched with some elements over others. I explain all this in much more detail in my new book, but for now, I'll focus on giant stars because they are the primary producers of elements necessary for life. This includes phosphorus, although giant stars don't produce the same amount of every element. For example, these stars generate a lot of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. Because these elements are the basis of the fusion chains that provide most of their energy, the so-called CNO cycle. Additionally, the final explosion of these stars produces large amounts of iron, which is why these four elements are among the seven most abundant in the universe. Phosphorus is scarce in the cosmos because its atoms only form when a silicon-30 atom absorbs a neutron and becomes silicon-31, which is very unstable and quickly turns into phosphorus-31. Since this process doesn't happen often within giant stars, the amount of phosphorus they expel into space is minuscule compared to the other chomps. Here's the important part. If the main mechanism for making phosphorus produces so little, most of the nebulas in the universe could be very poor in this element. And logically, the planets that form in them would be too. So if phosphorus is as critical for life as we think, the universe could be full of potentially habitable worlds that will forever remain uninhabited due to a lack of phosphorus. <laughs> if this has dampened your hopes of finding life on other planets soon, well, the outlook gets even worse because even planets formed in phosphorus-rich nebulas aren't guaranteed to have life. In fact, Earth might have been very lucky in this regard. As I've explained before, early Earth was so hot that most of its mass stayed molten, allowing the free metal it contained to sink to the core by its own weight, giving our planet a dense metallic core. But be aware that phosphorus has a strong chemical affinity for iron. As a result, this metal also dragged a lot of the primordial Earth's phosphorus into the core, leaving its rocky crust deficient in this element. Fortunately, at this time, the solar system was filled with asteroids and comets with unstable orbits that continuously collided with Earth. And I say fortunately, in this apocalyptic scenario, because these objects contain a lot of phosphorus in the form of minerals like schreibersite, an iron nickel phosphide, and apatite, a calcium phosphate. In other words, the bombardment of millions of phosphorus-rich meteorites returned to Earth's surface the phosphorus it lost during its formation. So even rocky planets formed from phosphorus-rich nebulas can end up with surfaces deficient in this element, and therefore be incompatible with life. It seems that biology made a poor choice in selecting phosphorus as an essential element for life, as the obstacles don't end there. We've seen that living beings are mainly made of chomps, but the atoms of these elements don't spontaneously combine to form life. They need a medium to drive them to group together and form increasingly complex, self-replicating organic molecules. The only known medium capable of doing this is water. Water can dissolve a wide variety of compounds present in our environment, and once in solution, these compounds can react more easily to produce life's basic molecules. Here, life faces one last obstacle. Phosphorus tends to be trapped in phosphate minerals like apatite. The problem is that phosphates are very insoluble in water. So even if a planet has oceans, rivers, and lakes, a prebiotic soup may never accumulate enough phosphorus for life to arise in it. It's quite ironic that phosphorus is so critical for life because it seems to do everything possible to avoid being part of it. It's not unreasonable to think that phosphorus scarcity and its low water compatibility drastically reduce the number of planets where life can emerge, which would explain why we don't see any signs of other civilizations in a universe as vast and ancient as ours. Due to phosphorus's low availability, the vast majority of habitable worlds might remain uninhabited. The cosmos could be filled with lifeless oceans, endless rocky plains in eternal silence, and sunsets of unimaginable beauty that will never be shared on any social media. The idea that we might be practically alone in the universe because of phosphorus isn't a cheerful prospect, but don't be too discouraged. While it's true that the absence of phosphorus could significantly limit life in space, this potential answer to the Fermi paradox is just a hypothesis. Our technology for studying exoplanets keeps improving, so it's possible that in the not-too-distant future, we may find evidence showing that phosphorus doesn't limit life as much as it seems, or it might confirm this theory. Who knows? Until then, we can only wait and keep scanning the skies.